Jaden Show, and here's your host, Jaden Cornelius. Welcome to another Jaden Show. It's Sunday, it's the 31st of July, which means tomorrow is going to be August. Where is this year going? And I hope it doesn't travel too quickly because I'm getting older and older and older. But anyway, I hope you're doing good. I hope you're having a lovely summer at the moment. I hope it's all good in wherever in the world you are. I hope you're enjoying it. Today, I've got a really, really great show. If you're an animal lover, then you're going to be so super stoked by today's guest. He is from the States. He is on his just finished his eighth series of Rocky Mountain Vet on Animal Planet. His name is Dr. Jeffrey Young. Let's go and see a bit of a match. If I could talk to the animals, just imagine it chatting with a chimp and chimpanzee. Imagine talking to a tiger, chatting with a cheetah. What a neat achievement it would be. If we could talk to the animals, learn all their languages, maybe take an animal degree. I'd study elephant and eagle. Buffalo and beagle, alligator, guinea pig and flea I would converse in polar bear and python And I would curse in fluent kangaroo If people asked me, can you speak rhinoceros? I'd say, of course, can't you? If I conferred with our furry friends Man to animal, think of the amazing repartee If I could walk with the animals Talk with the animals, grunt and squeak and squawk with the animals, and they could talk to me. Well, you've seen a little bit of Dr. Jeff, now let's go and meet him in person. Welcome this week's special guest. Dr. Jeff Young, welcome to the Jaden Show. How are you doing? Doing very good, Jaden. I'm glad you invited me. No, it's a bloody, it's wonderful to have you on on ship. It's amazing because I've actually met you quite a few years ago here in, in Quintana Roo in Mexico and was superbly impressed by the work you do here. And then I obviously delved a little bit deeper and found that you are, you know, Rocky Mountain hero as well. <laughs> and so like most people like, when they're kids, they either you know want to become a footballer, maybe a lawyer. Parents want them to work in a bank. When did you did you start like as a kid being really really heavily into nature and animals, or was it just something as you kind of grew up? It I I can't remember a time I didn't want to be a veterinarian. Having said that, I'm as a typical American in a lot of ways. I mean, I, I killed my first deer in the woods with a high powered rifle when I was ten years old. So I was raised hunting, trapping, all these kind of things. And, you know, then you and you go to vet school and dogs and cats were always in a different category or everything else. And now they're not in a different category. Yeah. Anymore. You know, you, you, you find out that animals all feel this pain the same way we do. Yeah. Um, and it just it changes your view. I, you either have to get really jaded or you have to, you know, change how you view the world. And, and vet school changed how I viewed the world pretty, pretty substantially. Mm-hmm. I, I remember reading something on I think it was on Twitter when someone was going really, really superbly crazy about the, the dog meat industry in Korea. And I was like, yeah, it's absolutely disgusting. It's absolutely, but you know, are you vegetarian? Well, no. Yeah, exactly. Okay, so <laughs> like, oh, well, no, but they're companion animals. I'm like, oh, bollocks, they're animals. Like, yeah, how can yeah. you differentiate between, oh, no, we can't we can't kill a kitten, but we can kill, and uh, you know, like a cow. And a, it's like, it's just... But it, it, even if you say, okay, humans are okay to eat meat, although, once again, depending on how you want to argue from a Buddhist standpoint, even from a Christian standpoint, we were mm. born vegetarians. And, but, you know, if you get the religion out of it, you know, we do just fine as vegetarians. So eating meat is our choice for sure. Mm. But even if I was say, you know, okay, I, I want to eat meat every now and then, I could live with that to some degree if it was done humanely. But That's the way, you know, we, we're doing like 18, 16, 18 billion animals a year in America. Now, you drive around this country, you don't see billions and millions of animals out, you know. So where are they out? Why are they all hidden? Yeah. Why are they all in barns? There's a reason for that because it's how cruel we treat them. Mm-hmm. And, and not only that, you have resistant, uh, resistant uh, 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 due to their antibiotic use, we have resistant bugs coming out of there. Mm-hmm. Uh, we have diseases. 
Um, and so it's not fair to them. It's not fair to us. And plus, in America, we, you know, something like uh, 50, 100 percent more meat than we should. But the USDA recommends that the USDA is very good because they're they've been bought and paid for by industry. Um, but, you know, the amount of even they admit we eat too much. And because of that heart disease, is number one killer in America, Bro prostate cancer, breast cancer have all been leaked to high meat, you know, um, eating. So there's health reasons not to do it. And, and then once again, I'm not going to condemn someone if they eat meat a couple of times a week, you know, um, but I think if you're going down eating, you know, fast food every day of the week, you, you kind of deserve what you get in some ways. Yeah. And, and quite frankly, it's just plain cruel. It's, it's horrible. And I don't think any rational human being can see how those animals are kept and slaughtered and transported and believe there's anything good about that. No, absolutely. And it's all about um, equilibrium and awareness, right? Absolutely. Like you said, if you know, it's with everything, you know, know what you're putting in your body, know what you're putting in, you know, to your mind, into everything. Yeah, it's just, you know, it's about everything's about awareness, you know, like I, I, I went to India and I was in a, in a, a vegetarian town, actually, and it was just, and even then they were kind of said, you know, you eat in complete silence because you're meant to be aware of everything that is nourishing your body. And I found it very difficult to keep my mouth shut and very <laughs> difficult not to laugh. And would for the first couple of weeks was going into hysterics with the silence and hearing people choose, chewing and stuff. But after that, I find it quite, um, quite amazing because when you're not talking and, and not and you're concentrating on what is nourishing your body, the flavors are completely different. Different, you yeah. feel completely different. It's all about, you know, and the mindfulness as well, you know, being in, in that state of awareness. is. I mean, I've been to India multiple times. And I have to say the hypocrisy of humans is, is in every country. Oh, but in course. India, the, the you know, uh, the Hindus don't eat meat typically. The lower class is more likely to eat chicken. And, and India is one of the biggest producers of chicken or soon will be in the world. Uh, so they do eat chicken. Um, having said that, there's cows, you know, they, they actually have, at large cows everywhere. That's a big problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, think, we think at large dogs, but they have at, at, at large cows. And a lot of times they basically, they, they, they'll round up the cows and they'll, they'll walk them down to a Muslim area where they do kill them and eat them, you know? And, and so it's like, okay, so you're kind of allowing that. You're just kind of like, you're not eating them, but you're, you know, you're creating just taking it down the road around the corner. Yeah, so it's kind yeah. of off of your, off of your shoulders, right? Yeah. So you, so you don't feel bad about it, you know? And yeah. so, I don't know, you know, you, you, I say one thing about the McDonald's over in India, they, they have about eight different vegetarian type burgers and they're really good. They don't have them here in America, but you have lots of options there. Wow. They do serve water Buffalo because that's not a cow. <laughs> okay. <the> <laughs> yeah. That's mad, man. It's, it's also, it's, us humans have been like this since the dawning of time, right? We haven't really changed that much. So. No, no, I don't. I don't think we changed at all. I mean, we're one step away from barbarism, you know, and, and you know, uh, total chaos. So, yeah, it's. Uh, I mean, the, the more we change, the more we stay the same, right? <laughs> yeah, no, completely, completely. So, so, did you? Would you like surrounded by pets? Was you the kind of kid that was always bringing a stray dog home, yeah. a stray cat, a broken a pigeon with oh. a broken wing, or? Snakes, you name it, anything, frogs, and yeah, you know, and 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 and, and once again, the, the hypocrisy for me of my childhood is that I always had animals around me, I always liked them, and I always took good care of them. But then I also went out and killed them all the time, you know. Oh, yeah, you yeah, know yeah. I spent a lot of summers on the farm, you know, and uh, you know, cut. I mean, I don't think I ever really enjoyed seeing it necessarily. I mean, even when I hunted when I was older, I, if there's such thing as an ethical hunter, I, I don't, you know, it was rare that I, it ever took two shots for me to kill anything. And my dad, my all my first shots. Were guns for one bullet my dad my stepdad grew up during the depression era and he would say you know give one bullet so you go get some food for us and he had to come back with food and he taught me the same thing he said if it takes more than one shot you're not doing it right you know right. so oh, yeah, yeah. but i've been out with a lot of people that just throw bullets out they wound animals um you know and it, it's uh i don't know yeah. it's more humane to me it's more humane to go out and shoot a deer and eat that than to go down and and get your your burger at a fast food restaurant oh, yeah. no, at, at this point in time you know yeah. not do you need any of it no because of the whole mass farming absolutely man so you became a vet when did you discover mexico and it's kind of it's severe need of education and better animal treatment it's it just in our blind luck um i started 
Somewhere along the line, um, I, I got into spay and neuter. I worked animal control when I was in vet school, and that really got me into, into uh, seeing animals, how they're dealt with, you know, in poor areas in the, U- in the U.S. So I dedicated myself to spay and neuter. I got a, a, a bus and started going around doing mobile spay and neuter. And somewhere along the line, people heard about me, you know, article here, article there. Uh, Esther Meckler from Spay USA got a hold of me, and I went to one of her first uh, conferences back in Boston. And, um, and I did several others, and then I started lecturing. Now, I've been to like 46 countries. I've, you know, I've done wow. surgical, surgical uh, training and lectures in, in 46 different countries and gone to a couple new ones, Bulgaria and uh, 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 Kosovo this fall, uh, back to India again in the, in the winter. So I've been there about five or six times now. So I, mean, I work all over the world, you know, uh, and I did all that long before Animal Planet came along. Um, but I was invited to speak at the University of Yucatan. And the only person that really spoke English, really good English, was uh, Dr. Tony. So I was hooked up to him with him, and he showed me around. And we, be, I mean, he's like a son to me, you know. Uh, and we're, we became really close. And at one point, I said, "Well, you know, let's uh, let's just build a clinic." And I went down there two or three times. We drove around, tried to pick the right area, um, and we got a really good location. And he's he's booming with business, you know. And, and I think the one thing about Tony is he. He understands where I come from. You know, I, then we didn't, I wouldn't run as a nonprofit. We just always did nonprofit stuff with our for, with, with our for profit, with our profit from our for profit company. Um, I might put probably close to 750,000 down in the Mexico. Wow. And uh, I've put more in that and other, you know, I'm in a bunch of Slovakia and then in the ITC over, you know, over in, in Playa. Uh, so, and I don't, you know, it's never been about return for me. It's about, you know, like I have, I've always had a good paycheck. And, and the bottom line is I feel good about being able to provide people with jobs in the future. And, and, and Tony, once again, took that ball and ran with it. And the, what he's done is just amazing to me, you know? Uh, so I, when you find the right people, it's not hard to invest in those people. No, absolutely. Absolutely. And so, so your first one was built in Merida, right? Yeah. Well, my first one was actually built in Slovakia. Um, okay. Once again, I was lecturing over there and, and met a vet, and he came to the states a couple of times. And I went over to lecture at a uni- at his university, and we were driving back. And I just said, you know, we should just build a clinic. He said, Yeah, let's do that. And I was like, Okay. So we just <laughs> like I'm, I, you know, everyone thinks I'm this genius businessman. Everything I've done is just blind luck. Okay. <laughs> uh, so I mean, I, I bought a, a, I was basically offered a, a building that was a vet clinic. Um, it was owned by a nonprofit and they, they, they built a big $3 million white elephant. They got rid of these three little clinics they had and they offered it to me for $65,000. You know, so I, I jumped in on it. I was, I was just went out of school bus at the time, jumped on it is over is one really rough neighborhood in, in Colorado and in, in Denver. It all changed. 24 years later, sold it for a million dollars. You know, oh, I like to say that was smart, yeah. but it was just blind luck. And, you know, and, <laughs> but it's and, working and, for you, and it's helping the animals as well. Yeah, so it, always, everyone's yeah, a winner. Exactly. I've always made more money off my because I've always bought. I've always been believed in buying property, not renting. So and I think I've always made money on the property. You know, so uh, I definitely have made money as a veterinarian. Wow, amazing! Of, of all the forty odd countries you've been to. I guess some of them probably hold special. Pl- I mean, probably all of them do because you know you're working with amazing people and amazing animals. But are there any places in particular that really pull on your heart that you just think oh, I just need to get back there? Oh, I, I mean, I think uh, Mexico is that place for me. You know, I mean, yeah. I, I've invested. I'm in, involved in you know three or four different clinics down there. Uh, we have the, our international training center. You understand? We've had hundreds of veterinarians come through our training center. Yeah, that's amazing. Outside of Playa. And I mean that, and that change that helped changes the world, you know. So I mean that's what I like about that. Um, and then the work that Tony does, and he he works with all kinds of, of veterinarians. Um, I think you know I would really like to at some point if I live to be old enough, I'd like to open a place in Montenegro just to deal with people in Eastern Europe. Uh, I think it's a it's a great opportunity. It's not a very big country. They have a lot of street dogs. I really think you can go in there in a five to seven year period show that you can take a whole country and change things um, just with low cost spay neuter and proper education. You know, um, so I, you know, I, I, I think India is kind of a special place for me. Um, and I haven't said that. I have friends that go over and they stay, you know, uh, go for yoga stuff, and yeah. they talk about how wonderful India is. I go, well, you don't go quite to the same India I go to, because you know, I mean, I go into the slums and I, I go places where I'm told not to go sometimes. Um, but you know. I work with a lot of people that really do care, and uh, and obviously the, the upper echelon of Indian society. But you know, 
the, the number of sheer number of people, I mean, they're, they're going to, if they're not, they're going to soon be more populous than China. And there's a lot of poverty. And I don't know how you go to a country. It's like going to Mexico and staying in an all inclusive hotel and say, oh. oh, how great Mexico is. Well, you don't know you Mexico. Don't know Mexico. No, well, you, even, Mexico. you can pretty much say that about the whole of Quintana Roo, actually, even yeah, exactly. here, particularly Mexico. Yeah. No, no, exactly. You know, and, and I, I really like, I get my hands dirty and go into the poor areas. And, you know, sometimes it's a little scary, but overall, I think that's where you make the biggest difference, you know? And I think people are the same everywhere in the world. That's the one thing I absolutely believe. No matter, you know, you can have different religious beliefs and different things like that, but in the end, people want, they want housing. They want to be able to eat. They want to, have, you know, take care of their kids. And if they have animals, they want to take care of, you know, I just don't see any place you know they just hate animals i guess is the point every any place i've been you know they, they all care about them yeah yeah it, it's a matter of not having the money to care about them properly necessarily no, absolutely absolutely well i mean the thing I've, i found the most about mexico after you know coming from england um where you know the animals are our babies and yeah, here, exactly. they were more a lot of them were more accessories to guard the car in the drive so yeah. they were always tied they were always tied to the, the gate or the tire or the kennel or something and that's why I ended up with 20 of my own <laughs> ran, ran raiding people's front gardens and saying, is that your dog? Okay. No, well, it's mine now. Thank you very much. Here's 500 pesos. And that was kind of, you know, and that was kind of how I started my collection. But, um, yeah, it's just, I, I kind of feel that, um, an interesting going to, to see people about the Spain neutering clinics when you know they have a dog that's living on the street and it still has its testicles and you say, look, it's free, look, you know, let me take it and I'll bring it back later, everything will be fine. No, why no? Because it's a man. Yeah, that's always yeah. young males. See, that's young males are the problem everywhere in every country. Yeah. It's, high, it's testosterone. They need their testicles, man, because it's a boy. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, I was gonna say, is there not, it's not your testicles, but- No, it's like, exactly. I yeah. think we should be taking yours, dude. You simmer down. But, yeah, I mean, when, I was, when I was told that when I went to Mexico, I was always told, well, Mexicans don't believe in spay neuter. Uh, Mexicans will never get their male dogs done. And I have, there's always the male, the, you know, the, the human male that, that that's true for. But the vast majority of people, first oh, nice. off, it's usually, it's usually the moms, that, you know, the mothers in the household that bring them. And women should be in charge as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. But, you know, like, and, and they always bring the females first. And, and the, you know, the, my fellow Americans say, look, they only bring females. Well, yeah, because they're the ones having the babies. These people aren't stupid you know they yeah. they know if they can bring one dog today and get it done they're gonna get the female done Absolutely. because you no know, it just takes one male to breed lots of females but you know i you know the next the second third time we go to the same place all this all of a sudden the male starts showing up you know yeah. so um i i just think we got to give people more credit than than what we often do no absolutely and it is changing drastically actually yeah. i've noticed that in the last how long have i been here six years it's changed a lot and people's mentality have changed has changed a lot and that's you know yourself and, and the other amazing vets that you know live and work around here that are starting to you know really kind of make some um kind of physical difference in in the way people are actually treating their animals now which is amazing so what does the future hold for you apart from building more clinics i mean because you've obviously you've gone through your health problems and your health crisis and stuff like that you know so um how how has that affected you? Are you taking more of a kind of, are you chilling out a little bit to make sure you're doing good? Or are you just like, fuck, full <laughs> steam ahead, dude. Let's yeah, just do this. I just Listen, I, I, you know, time I get done with surgery and I'm doing, I'm back to 10, 12 hour days where, you know, in America, we're so shorthanded, everybody's shorthanded, can't find enough vets. So, uh, Dr. Petra and I work all the time, very long hours and, you know, I can barely walk by the end of the day, but okay. I will do that the day I die. Um, we're planning on moving from the clinic we have now up to Conifer, which is about 30 minutes from where we're at. And my goal there is to do the same thing we've done at the ITC is basically make more of a training type facility for vet students. Cause the, one of the problems in america all the vet students coming out have very little hands-on mm -hmm. uh they're all taught you have to refer everything out refer everything out you can't do explorers you can't do broken bones and we're comp quite accomplished in those things uh and i you know we're not specialists by any means but quite frankly i feel like i'm as good as most specialists when it comes to soft tissue and i believe that petra is about as good as most specialists when it comes to bone surgery so if we can enable young students to see things and and to learn some things where they have more confidence they're going to go out and be able to do more um because it right now it's just it's tough every you know the, the prices keep going up corporations got involved in about the 90s um so everything's going corporate and you know explorers are for you know i mean our highest price anything is about 2000 2500 and some of those things are quote we're seeing quotes of 10,000 to 25 
the same thing, you know. I, I don't know how you rationalize that. We know for sure only about 40% of Americans can under, can afford current current veterinary prices. You know, that means 60% can't. You no, know? And then you have Absolutely. insurances which have gone through the roof as well. Gone through the roof. And they don't, and they don't cover genetic things. So well, they don't cover bad. anything you need them for. No. Exactly. Yeah. 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 No, that's, like a, lab, a Labrador with hip issues. Oh, well, we don't cover yeah, that. That's no, genetic. sorry, <laughs> sorry, we can't do that. If you have a hamster that's broke its toe, yeah, we can cover that. 40, <laughs> yeah. 45 pounds, absolutely. We'll give you 35. That's cool. And if your dog goes out and gets hit by a car, you know, that, that insurance is great for that. But for yeah. your routine, average stuff, uh, not that good at all. Uh, so. Absolutely, absolutely. But, and it's it's really interesting. My, it was always my dream to become a vet. But I was really scared of blood. And I was desperately, <laughs> desperately <laughs> allergic to cats and dogs. Now, I have 12 street dogs. I have seven street cats. I've seen so much blood and guts and gore in the last six years. I'm completely immune to the whole, yep. especially after helping at sterilization clinics as well. It's just like, yeah, I, I still have my allergies, but I think at nearly 50 years old, I'm a little bit too late to become a vet now. I think. Yeah, yeah. I don't know. I, I see the, oldest, the, the gentleman I graduated with uh, was 56 when he graduated vet school. So really? Yeah. How yeah. super cool. Oh, maybe I still got a chance thinking. Must, if my singing don't take off in the next couple of years, then maybe I'll, <laughs> I'll, I'll be booking myself in six miles down the road at PPI. There you go. There <laughs> That's you go. What doing. So where where can people find you on the on the internet? Where are where are you? Well, um we're I'm trying to we're trying to expand our, our, our footprint in social media. And once again, I'm kind of a doofus when it comes to computer stuff. Uh but plantpettedinternational.org, plantpettedinternational.org, um, and there's Plant Pitted Mexico, um, Plant Pitted International Mexico, and there's Plant Pitted Mexico. So, okay. you know, any of those kind of things you can hook into. Yeah. Um I'm I'm on I'm trying to do Facebook under um uh, Colorado's Dr. Jeff. Um, I think that's what it is anyway. Uh, we're trying to work out a new Facebook um, in that because if you do if you do one for a company, you don't, you, I mean, a personal one, I'm limited to 5,000. I always have 5,000 people, you know, so um, so we're, I'm on, uh, on, I guess, Instagram under Dr. Neuter, D-R-N-E-U-T-R. So people fo follow all people follow that. But we do post some pretty gory stuff because, you know, that's kind of a, a so format about, right? for yeah. that. Yeah. So, I mean, you know, and I, I think I post a lot of stuff on there. People a lot of time, I, I'll say it now, now for the rest of the story, you know, I mean, you'll see something, you'll say, oh, this is horrible. The person waited too long. And they did. But the thing is, they're not bad people. You know, it, it comes back to finances. And I think that's the part I keep trying to drive home that, you know, if, if you're a little lady on a fixed income and you've been to two or three vets and, they've, you know, they're saying, well, we'll do this for five thousand or ten thousand dollars. You know, it's not going to happen. And at some point, six months later, they find us. And there's this horrible mass or whatever we got to deal with, you know, and, and they got a dollar ninety five left, you know, yeah. uh, and that's what we do best, you know, is we work with people like that, and you know, and and I'm outraged at first when I see that, and I'm just like this poor animal, but then you know, you get the backstory, and it's like they've been trying, and they there's what do you do, you know? I mean, it's either I don't know, it's just there's there's no one answer other than I think we you know we're just out of control in terms of what we want to charge for things. And there's nothing wrong with vets making money. I'm you know, I always say assume assume for a minute I'm in it for a little bit of money anyway, you know, but you can find that balance. And it's so many of the corporates is all kind of dictated on how you do things and you you just you can't you can't vary from it. That's the point. You know, there's no humanity in it, you know, and I find that really sad. Yeah. But that's across the health sector full stop. Yes. It's yeah, not absolutely. just animal patients. No, it really isn't. Yeah, no. You know, I mean, in fact, probably probably with majority of the things that humans are involved in, unfortunately. Yeah. It's about yeah. always the need of me before the need of anything else, isn't it? And that's kind of, I think that's what I've struggled with the most as well over the years. I've always kind of tried to look at life with kind of what's in it, you know, not what's in it for me, but what can I bring to this? What can I give to this situation? Yeah. How can I be of service in this situation? And I think that's kind of like completely opposite to... Well, I, I think there's a lot of people that feel that way out there. I yeah. think they're good people, you know. But the problem is, the people who are, can be the most influential and have the most money Absolutely. are not those people. 
Absolutely. You know, absolutely. At, you know and I and I struggle with it all the time. I mean, I, I feel I I'm you know like at the top probably ten percent of the world in terms of income, and you know I, I make a hundred thousand dollars a year, but I have properties and stuff like that. On paper, I'm worth quite a bit. I always say, you give me the money, I'll give you the paper. <laughs> you know, the bank owns more than I do. Yeah. But in the end, you know, it, it, it's 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 trying to find that balance all the time. You know, how much do you give away? How much do you keep? And I I don't I've never felt like a, a greedy person. Money's never been a motivator for me. Wow make a difference has been a motivator for me, but there's nothing wrong, you know, and, and people say money doesn't matter. Well, it doesn't matter if you have it, but when you don't have it, it, really it shows matters. how it matters. Absolutely. If you're worried about eating or where you're sleeping and things like that, well, it the next matters a lot. Is the yeah, completely. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Absolutely. yeah. So absolutely. once you get a certain amount, it matters a whole lot less. There's no yeah. question about that. But if you don't have that certain amount, it, it's the one thing that does matter. Yeah, no, I know. I can completely appreciate how that feels, <laughs> especially yeah, yeah. 20 youngins to, you know, 20 um, <laughs> three animals to care for on a daily basis. So, no, absolutely. There's always that panic. So, what is the future? Are you still doing um, the Rocky Mountain Vet series? Is that, well, is that the, we did finish season eight, and um, I technically we haven't been canceled. We haven't been renewed. I, odds are we won't do another season. And the truth is, everyone thinks you're on TV, you're rich. It costs more for us to be on TV than what we ever I made. Imagine, and that's hard to believe, but it's the truth, you know. And part of it's got to, I didn't have good lawyers, <laughs> but ignoring that, I didn't have any lawyers. I just, you know, you, you agree to things and you find out, oh, they have lawyers writing all this, you know. But yeah. it, I mean, it was a great thing to do. And I, and I have, you know, no, no bad feelings towards, uh, you know, Animal Planet in that way. Uh, uh, it did give me a platform and, and I certainly am trying to use it more and more. Once again, it, it would have been better if I was a little bit more socially uh you know and and in tune to to computers and stuff but uh we're, we're working on things and and in the end i you know i, I say i still plan on lecturing i still plan on and helping I, when i can we're gonna we're gonna have a big spay neuter clinic down in puerto morales in november and we're hoping to do a thousand animals there so uh plan on being down for that you know so uh yeah well, and good I, to see I, you I, in november yeah, I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't let grass grow under my feet very much, so. No, it's, I never thought that anyway, to be fair. Well, Dr. Jeff, thank you so much for being part of my show. I super appreciate your time. You've been a bloody amazing. Please keep doing what you're doing and helping all that because, you know, there's not many people that, well, there are quite a few people that pioneer for the, those yes. that can't, you know, fight for themselves. But however, I think, you know, the, the balance is still kind of tipped against their favor. So, you know. Yep. So, I agree with that. We're outnumbered, but yeah. So, but thank you. We don't so get. Much. We don't give up. No, thank well, you. can't. We wouldn't sleep if we did, would we? So that's the thing. So anyway, thank you so much. I will see you in November, and we'll talk to you on the show maybe in November. We can talk about the Spain Neuter Clinic and where it is and what's going on, and we can promote that. That'd be really cool. That'd be great, Jeff. Thank you so much. Take super good care of yourself. Thank you, Jay. I'll, I'll do my best. You later, mate. Bye bye. Well, if you're around in Quintana Roo in Puerto Morelos in November time, then why don't you come and help out at the Spanish Nutrient Clinics? They are really super rewarding. You meet amazing people, but also you get to be doing your thing to help the innocents, the animals that um, need desperate amount of care here in Mexico. So if you're available and if you're free, then come and join in. You can also go and search for Jeff all over his social media platforms and go and support his work. Follow the, the Plan Pet of the International websites as well that you saw running along the bottom of the interview and just spread the word, spread the word. It's all about awareness and education. So um, if people are aware that these things are going on and have more information, then we can start making more changes, right? Anyway, thank you so much for being part of my show again now i forgot to ask if dr jeff sings because maybe he could have done a little live outro for me but i forgot so i'm really really sorry so you're going to be stuck with me and i think well actually this is it from my group in the 90s called beyond and this song was actually from an amazing film with Virginia McKenna. The film was called Born Free, and this was the title track to this song. And I was allowed by one of the writer's son to change and to rewrite some of the lyrics of that song. I think his name was Mr. Black, but I can't, Clive Black, I want to say. But anyway, um, he allowed me back in the 90s to change and rewrite some of the songs. So this was Beyond's version of Born Free. What an amazing end to an amazing show. Thank you so much. Follow me on my social media platforms. I will see you next week for another fantabulous edition of The Jaden Show. Take care. Stay beautiful. What's the number?
Free as the wind blows As free as 